Yeah. We met years ago with, with Mayor Mike, but uh, okay, I guess we're live now. Great guy. We're, great guy. We're making some rough start here today, but anyways. Um, Hello, it's Monday. Monday. Hello. Monday. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone out there. And it's Monday. I hope you're all doing well. Hyacinth has a couple of as, com as couple always, notices, and then we'll get quick into our guest, okay. which most of you can see is Mayor Joseph Gannon from Bridgeport, a candidate for governor. On the, the Democratic side, so okay. why don't you? I'll just go ahead and do my my do uh, little announcements quick, and then we'll move on. So, hello everyone out there. Hope you're doing well today. It's a beautiful day out there. Hope you're enjoying it, or if you're watching us, please uh, watch us, and then you can get outside and have a good time outside. So, as I want to just kind of keep you updated on what's going on, um, usually Charter Oak um, Van is going to be at the Wellness Senior Center. Um, every first and third Friday of the month. So hope you have any illness or anything that you need taken care of, you can always go by there. It will be at 830 Maple Avenue. And don't forget uh, Promise Zone Farmers Market, and that's going to go on until August, um, September, and October. And that's on Saturdays um, in the North End. Um, what they call it, the North, North United Church, Methodist Church in the North End. So you can always go there and pick up your fruits, fresh fruits and vegetables. Okay. And your family day, can't forget that. And uh, also, there's no more rent rebate at the Senior Center. It's all finished. So this is it for the South, South End Wellness Senior Center. So if you need any help along that, you need to call 211 and perhaps they can kind of fill you in on where to go. And so I always want to mention the Barry Square Community Day event coming up August 19th. It may look like a far away, but it's just right around the corner. That's happening from um, 12 to 4 p.m. And that's going to be at the Webster Theater parking lot. Don't forget now we're going to have a lot of giveaways and we are sponsored by a lot of good people here. You know, like the bank, the police union, fire union. Latin American Firefighters, Trinity College, Sina, City of Hartford, um, and a lot of good folks. And okay. well, my, my former U lieutenant um, giving us bikes, bikes and stuff like that. Before we go too so, much further, let me just say happy birthday to you. Oh, oh my birthday is gone already. It was dear. this weekend, but happy birthday. So. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, um, yeah. we've got a lot of ground to cover here. All right, so we'll so be talking more about it. Yeah, yeah we we'll got, talk more about it as the week uh, goes by, okay? Yeah. okay? So we have a special guest today. We've got... We got it to work out today. It was supposed to happen a couple weeks ago, I'm and glad things I'm happened. Here. So thank you for putting um, up with my schedule. Welcome. We've got Joe Gannum, and why don't you let's start? You know, I've got a bunch of questions to go to, but why don't you start? Tell us a little bit about who you are, where you came yeah, from. Tell us about, and yourself. give us a little bit of your history. You know, it is so important right now, and I will. It's so important for viewers to understand the dynamics of what's going to happen on August 14th, the Democratic primary. So the backdrop of me introducing myself to those that don't know me, kind of just talking to those that maybe have met me before or, or, or know a little bit about me, um, I want to encourage them to ensure there's primaries. I'm focusing on the Democratic primary because that's the one I'm in. It's a two-person primary. I'm on line B or row B. I'm the candidate for governor. By the way, that bottle of water is for you if you want it. Oh, so. <laughs> so I'm running for governor because as mayor, but also as just someone who lives in the state as a father, Someone who understands, I think, unfortunately or fortunately, some of the challenges that people have all across Connecticut, maybe more so in our cities, some of our communities that could use greater help, support, assistance, that uh, we need, with things that are way off on the wrong track, we need to put Connecticut back on track. Um, I come with a skill set, having run Bridgeport um, for a number of years, and I'll share some of that experience with you, to put Connecticut back on track and to build what I like to think of as a new Connecticut economy, because it's about jobs right now, a new Connecticut economy that works for everyone. It can't just be for a special or, or the wealthy few or some people over here are doing well. When, it, when the majority of people or a large number of people are struggling, families struggling to make ends meet, worried about the quality of education in our public schools, sometimes the safety, even not just in our, in our bigger uh, communities, but safety in schools across Connecticut, of course, is, critical but creations for jobs as a second chance mayor I talk about second chances and re-entry I talk about that as an element of a good decent and, a, and, 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 and rewarding society 
for people that want to come back and make a contribution to their families, to their communities or whatever, but also first chance opportunities for people who just want and deserve the opportunity for whatever it is that, that they feel is part of the American dream that they're willing to work for here in Connecticut. Not putting them in a position where they have to leave Connecticut because it, it costs too much or there isn't a job or, they, or leave a community because they feel the schools aren't good enough or they can't find affordable housing. But so these are some of the challenges that are, that are facing Connecticut. And I think I understand. After 14 years, on and off, in, out, and then back in, um, of balancing budgets, holding the line on taxes to make it as affordable as we can for people just to make ends meet, uh, who own homes, who own cars. Um, Building in, 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 in my city, um, development, ballpark, like Hartford has a wonderful ballpark now, an arena, waterfront development, um, outdoor amphitheater, tax-based growth. We have a billion dollars investment going on there with companies coming in from out of state. And that's the type of thing we need in all of our cities and to happen in Connecticut. Um, look, I'm, I'm, for, I'm for helping and for making sure that people in every city and town in Connecticut have an opportunity to succeed. But I also understand the dynamics of reshuffling the priorities and utilizing our cities as the engines that can, in many ways, drive a new and, and better Connecticut economy for, for everyone. So yes, um, that's a way of backdrop and things I want to do. Um, and there's so much more that we can talk about, and certainly with your questions, maybe we can get yeah, into some yeah. specific topics. Well, one of the big questions I got from people that I told over the weekend that you were going to come on, they're like, how are you going to address the elephant in the room? And I think it's important we get that out of the way right up front. Mm -hmm. You know, you did have some problems. You were arrested and tried for basically corruption. You did your time on that. And the people of Bridgeport felt strong enough to bring you back as the mayor. And I think you've been doing a very good job since they brought you back. I think they, they, how do you, yeah, sure. how does that make you a better candidate for governor because of your life experience? Because of my life experiences, it's, it's well put. I think it does. Whether it's a level of understanding of, of, of even a greater level of, of, of Sometimes we use the word humility, of, of recognizing challenges that just through my personal experiences with not casting blame, but accepting a fault, of taking on responsibility, of apologizing publicly, of having a discussion like this in a public forum, um, really willing to say, hey, look, you know, um, if, there, if anything's come out of that, certainly any harm that's come out, I take, I take the blame for and have kind of paid, if you will, at least in our criminal justice system, my debt to society. So what is the world supposed to look like after that? In other words, are people, and you can't, you can't force this, but it's an element of discussion, and every person has to make a decision on it. Are we a society that really does believe if you have done that? If, in other words, if you if you failed to the extreme that I, that, that I did by breaking the law, and if you pay your debt, and you want an opportunity to make a contribution from lessons learned, uh, from mistakes made lessons learned, are we a place that allows collectively people to have that second chance? Well, well that's, you know, that's part of it, you know, and I'm not, I don't want to get confrontational here, but I think it's very hypocritical for some of our state leaders to say we're a second chance society, but it's almost like they add the caveat, except for Joe Gano. And I don't think that's, that's right. And I think, you know, without putting a lot of my own feelings into this, especially in our urban areas so many people whether it's because of drug charges or whatever have gotten themselves in trouble and find their lives upset because of a felony conviction right and to have that label convicted felon is very difficult and i think we need to look at that did the person accept blame and did they change and grow from it right or you know do they continue in the same behavior but you know, with, with that being said you know, with some of the research I've done over the weekend and the things, when you first came in as mayor of Bridgeport, you were apparently facing a projected two hundred and fifty million dollar deficit. Over five and years, and you turned that into a. We turned it into so what we did surplus. was the city. My predecessor filed for bankruptcy. So Hartford talked about it, but Bridgeport, my predecessor in the early '90s, had actually filed. So it was in bankruptcy court. I withdrew the bankruptcy. The goal of the bankruptcy was to break the union contracts and the pensions, and I said, no, let's deal with these problems openly and honestly and as a team. And we got labor to work with management and business to work with government and grassroots organizations at different levels of government to come together. And so we took, we withdrew the bankruptcy, um, and instead of a $250 million accumulated deficit over five years, we balanced the budget for 10 years in a row without raising the taxes. We revamped re the city's health care plan. Um, 
we uh, got economic development going, a business conference downtown, and um, we're able to use efficiencies and, and a variety of things that would take too long to discuss right now in order to put the fiscal stability into the state's largest city, Bridgeport, that um, allowed economic development and growth while improving public safety with community policing and, and even instituting after school programs for young people. So so look it makes it sound like I'm saying, oh my goodness, you took you took a situation and um, you know you take you pat yourself on the back. I'm not. And cities are always work in progress. So anybody that tells you in whatever role they play, right. they, they, I see how active you are. Yeah. It, every day you wake it. up and before you go to bed at night, mm -hmm. there's more to do. Yeah. The schools are never good enough. But, the streets are never clean enough. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's yeah. those type of things. I have I have a question for you. Um what have you learned from going into prison and come back out? And the second question would be, why do you think people should trust you for that second chance? Yeah, we all talk about, yeah, we give you a second chance, and that's fine. But why should people trust you? And what have you learned? Being there, coming back out. Yeah. Sell us on why we should vote for Joe Gannon. It is, there's just two things. There's, there's two things going on. Um, and the, the first one is maybe a little more bigger picture than I'll go right to me. We're at, we're at a critical point in the state. I've never seen it so bad where failures on the part of effective policies have created uh, insufficient insufficient support and for people, especially people in need, for the relationship between cities and towns and the government, state government, and lack of stability that's causing business to leave, take with them with jobs, and we know the residual effect. On the second chance piece of it, you have a thousand individuals returning citizens coming into each of our cities, not collectively across the state, into each of our cities, the Hartford, New Haven, Bridgeport, Waterbury, every year, every year. And and with with, a, with an eye towards, as you said, if they're hollow commitments to, wait a minute, we're better than that. If someone does come out, has learned something from from errors, mistakes, breaking the law, um, the impacts it caused, and is willing to step up with a certain level, as I've mentioned, humility and, and hopefully transparency and accountability and says, you know, I get it. I learned a lot from that. God, had I, had I really thought, had I, had I used my better judgment and never allowed that to happen, um, the world would be different. But, but it's done, and it can't be undone. But what can be done is an effort towards, as I like to say, maybe if I have something to offer in the world of government or public service, because what you talked about, that taking a city from bankruptcy and putting it back on track and instilling confidence and restoring property values and making neighborhoods safer and getting rid of gangs and, and, and all that. It's definitely something we need on the state It was a right positive now. contribution. And, and, and so if I have the ability to make that contribution and maybe make good directly or indirectly, is what I said when I came back in Bridgeport, on some of the places where I failed before, then maybe I am the best person if I've learned from that, and I have. And if we convince a person, now there's, there's three categories that, that you might be able to look to. One is the tens of thousands that elected me three years ago, almost two, two and a half years ago, and said, we're gonna give you a second chance to come back as mayor. Um, with a renewed sense, as you said, Joe, of the sanctity of the public trust, which I've expressed, um, with remorse, which certainly I have, with um, understanding better of the mistakes that can be made and how to avoid them. And then, even within that process, the, I don't know if you know this, but the individual who was head of the municipal corruption investigation for the federal government in Bridgeport at the time that, that, that we're talking about, when I came back and thought about running again, said that he would support me and cut me back. And then I asked, well, how could you help me? Could you help me with transparency and accountability to make sure that we're even a better government on a local level or whatever level? And he did, and he works in the mayor's office in Bridgeport now in charge of, he's a senior advisor to accountability and transparency. And then, so those are two things. The people, then the, the uh, head of the um, federal government who did that, and you can see the position he's taken. And then thirdly, I think there's a level that, I hope I've been able to, dem to demonstrate, that there's a lot of people, 32,000 of them around the state, not Bridgeport residents who may have, been, may have been hurt, but also may benefit from my good work, who may have an attraction, or sometimes you know you like your mayor kind of thing, from all cities and towns across Connecticut, or as many as we can reach out to, who signed my petitions, 32,000. Well that's something, I don't think anybody who's not involved in politics and has never had to go out there and get those signatures doesn't realize what a monumental task that is. And it's, you know, you'll go to stand outside a grocery store to get signatures. Oh yeah, I'm a registered Democrat. Oh yeah, I can vote. And then you go back to the voter list 
and scratch them off, scratch because they're not scratch registered. Off thousands, and thousands. <laughs> it's it's, it's a huge task. So for you to be able to do that, but when you decided you were, you know, once you were did your time and you got out of prison, and you decided you were going to run for the mayor of Bridgeport again, what kind of feedback? What kind of pushback? And how is that translating into a run for statewide office? Same type of questions, same type of inquiries, certainly. Because and this is not to mean impersonal, not to me, it's a different profile for someone to look at running for office. Generally, you don't have someone who has a felony conviction, right? It's just not, you may, you know, we've gone through- Probably a lot that should, but, <laughs> but they don't. Right, so, so people ask the questions. Um, the importance of it is in many ways, there's gonna be a certain amount of people that are just um, very strongly against, judgmentally, and it's where they come from, and, and that's a, you know that's where they come from. There is certainly a lot of people that will express a view that you know what I'm for at least in concept. It may not apply to voting for me or voting against, or voting for someone else in the situation. I'm for second chances. If someone has whatever happened, takes blame responsibility for it, pays their debt to society as the law requires recognizes mistakes, tells you that they've learned something from it, maybe in a greater degree of, of, of humility, and can apply a skill set with that added experience, as difficult or as bad as it was, um, are open to being supported. And then there's also a third group that's kind of still trying to figure it out, and that's understandable. So to that group, I think in this process, they've got a couple things to look at. They can look at me as a whole person, I hope, um, and say, they can, they can end the question there and decide whether they want to allow me or not. In other words, give me their vote. Or they can put that up against um, what is it that I'll be able to do because, the, because of, I have public record experience, different than my opponent. See, that, that's the part that, you know, and, and I talked to quite a few people over the weekend of, you know, that you were coming on. That's why I was, up until the minute you came through the door, I was kind of like, oh no. But um, I talked to a lot of people. And as soon as I mentioned your name, that was the, almost the immediate comeback was, I can't vote for a convicted felon. And I was like, okay, then why would you vote for the challenger? Oh, I don't know, but I just can't vote for a felon. So how do you overcome that and let, you know, get people to really trust you and say, yeah, I made a mistake, really I learned what I did was wrong, and now I'm willing to pour my soul out there and move forward. Okay. So how do you do that? Yeah, you got something you want to say? Well, no, I, I, I want to go back to what your plan is for the for well, yeah, to we'll, make, we'll get into to that. Make this, make, make this whole um, state be a more attractive place. And, you know, as I was talking to people, they said, oh, well, yeah, he's for the poor people. But I'm looking for a governor who's going to be for all people. I don't care whether you're poor or not or whatever the case may be. It's a, ba it's a balancing but, act, but becoming I, you know, a, a governor. I don't want to make light of this, but this has been an issue during the campaign. Who do you think is going to relate more to the everyday everyday citizens in the state of Connecticut? The guy with the 11 bathrooms or somebody who's stumbled along the way, has pulled himself back up, and is, is going forward? Um, I just think, personally, I have a lot more in common with the average person I meet on the, street, on the streets of Hartford than I do a millionaire at the Capitol or at a cocktail party or something. It's just we need... So much of our government has been taken over by big money. We need people who can relate to you and I. Hey, how does Hyacinth pay her health care bills? Where does she able to put food on her table every week for her family? You know, your car insurance, your car taxes, can she pay that? Are we doing everything we can as a state to make sure everybody is uncomfortable, not just the well-offs, but all the way down the line? Um, and I think that's what we need somebody, we need politicians we can relate to. And I'm not saying I can relate to everything you've done or what you go through, but I just think money is not everything when it comes to politics. Right. No question. Look at the, the my opponent's got. And I'm not working for your campaign. No, you're just. These, these are just <laughs> no, my no, you're speaking from your heart. But he's got 90 to 300 million dollars. I've got 90 to 300 million dollars less than him. But I've got an understanding of the dynamics and the challenges that we have. I think I thought I was a sensitive mayor as to the challenge that people have that are um, out of work that um, are coming back with second chance uh, looks for second chance or first chance looking for affordable housing looking for good schools by going through that petition process and meeting many of those people that signed individuals that signed i met people who came up to me and 
is closer than we are right now would just give me a hug and say, please, will you, you, you must understand you've been through some challenges, not casting fault or, 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 or excuse, um, but just saying, if you, can you, I have challenges, they may not be legal, they may not have, but they have, don't forget, will you help? And, and, and so I became even more sensitive in this process to the challenges that people have. And I hope in that, that if, if they do feel at the end of the day, before they go in and fill out that voter card, that I'm the, the one who can best positively impact because of my skills, because of my commitment, maybe because of my passion, because of my life experiences. Those we've talked about, many that I have it. And you know what? Maybe it is the right decision, and maybe maybe I'll have the opportunity to put Connecticut back on track and make it better. I, I just keep looking at my notes here. Yeah. The fact that you did away yeah. with a $250 million deficit sounds exactly like what the state of Connecticut needs right now. Someone that okay, so that's this that, that's the city. You, you got to deal with the 169 towns. You got to deal with the state. It's not just about dealing with one little city. The point is that... Well, it's a big city, but you're right. <laughs> it's a little city. city. It's, it's the what, largest city in but, the state. But the point is that, yeah, you do that there. It, it's something that we have to look at. And, 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 you know, this is what I found with people in general. And in general, okay, so they have these great ideas before they get elected, what they want to do, and they get there, and they're stuck, and they cannot... They, don't, they, they forget sometimes who put them where they got. And, you know, I, I, I follow all these politicians. You help them and you get them there. And it seems like they forgot who helped them get to where they get. And I'm not just talking because about don't big corporations. You know, I'm talking about the little people at the bottom or wherever. And that's lots of the complaint we hear from people all the time about, sure. yeah, we elect that person. Mm -hmm. You know, we've elected mayor for this city before. And, he, he, you know, he was the most humble person and we really dragged behind him. And then second term came around and he became something that we didn't know who that person was. And I'm just, how do we stay humble sure. with even in a big position like that? Yeah, and, and I think it's you're more vulnerable to that coming from somewhere like my opponent from the business world who's never been through the process. You think you can do things or you may want to. Without the government experience, you're gonna, you could get what you got with Trump. <laughs> a multi-millionaire ends up, says he's going to do all this stuff, and the stuff he's doing is damaging now. Mm -hmm. Killing uh, us. But he also, and I'm not supporting him, but he also came from a totally different, and like you just said, the business world right. as opposed to government. In the business world, you own your own business to get this done. If not, you're out of here. Right. And you're a tyrant. Where that doesn't work in government, and we need people that are willing, you know, it's about leadership and building a good team. Anyway, Kevin, I want to hear more about how is he going to well, build the state back? Because, yeah. you know, we're at a junction in, a, in in the state of Connecticut now. We're losing the young people. We're losing our seniors. They're going somewhere else. They're not staying in Connecticut. Are you reading my notes here? <laughs> no, no, no. But these are the things what we need to do. How do we build this Connecticut back so people can feel like this is the best place well, let's get they to want to move to? A couple more to. of the hot button issues. Okay, what else? Let's start with the, first, the income tax. Are you in favor of that? Do you need, think it needs to be revised? Or what well, are I was your just plans? It's funny. I was just talking to a reporter on the way in. And so uh, one of the Republicans, or two of them, are talking about repealing the income tax. So, so my questions are mm -hmm. it's a That's nine billion Where dollar revenue, come from? revenue source. Mm -hmm. So does that mean you're going to gut all your education funding? You're going to gut all your aid to cities and towns, and then you and you're going to push property taxes up? You may as well just go in and say instead of saying you're going to do that, why don't you go in and say you're going to raise property taxes? And be honest with people. Yeah, that's what you're going to do. We're going to double the property taxes. sales tax, right? Yeah. We're going to double the mill rate in all of our cities and towns, and um, we're going to we raise the sales tax. That's what my opponents, I guess, on the Republican side, would be um, would be saying they're going to do. So I don't I don't. I don't get it. What do you think about the oversight board for, for Hartford? What do you think about that? Well, I had one in Bridgeport years ago. When I first came in, it was bankrupt. It was an oversight board. I didn't like it. I thought they weren't responsive to the taxpayers and that they, they try to tell the city sometimes some of the information they gave was good, some of the rules that they abide by is good. But the other end of it is the people are entitled to elect their officials who they want. Right. They, whether you like your mayor or you don't, you get a right to elect them or vote them in or vote them out. You right. can't vote a, a review board in or out. But there is a role because there's a lot of state money going in. They, you know, that was one of the things they did. They put that proposal out there. Um, so uh, that's really up to Hartford. The 
Harford wants it. Okay, but you are going to be the governor of the state of Connecticut, and the capital is. Uh, the other, the other really issue that's really important to deal with is with the pilot for the state. No question about it. You know, that's 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 the state. Look at I got in every city. Pilot is is, is you, you know payment in lieu of taxes. So what happens is in our in our major cities, not just our major cities, but predominantly our major cities, you have a percentage of your tax base, your property tax, your buildings, which you're not able to tax. Sometimes 40, 45 percent. So all the buildings you see, they're supposed to all pay the you know, same tax rate generally, unless you have a split mill rate, which, which Arthur does. But there's there, the state courthouses and the hospitals um, are tax exempt. They don't pay tax. Yeah. Colleges, religious Colleges, buildings. Thank you. Yeah, so, so there's a reimbursement, maybe not for religious buildings, but for the others, there's a reimbursement by the state. It says, okay, the courthouse doesn't pay a tax, but if it did pay a tax, it would be it's three million a year. Mm -hmm. So we're going to pay you three million a year. But what they don't, what they don't do is they either don't pay anything on it, they don't. or they pay a reduced amount, and then the, the city's hurt. So that's that's a, lot of, we got a fully fund pilot. A lot of people don't understand in there. If you fully funded pilot, I don't think Harford would have any financial problems. Probably and, not. And the one thing, the big disadvantage we have that Bridgeport, Stamford, and other towns don't, is our land size, our square mileage, and our grand list. We really can't grow it that much where Bridgeport still has, has some land available and you've got a much larger grand list than Hartford has. So, um, you know, I don't know if it's larger. How many square miles is Hartford? About 17, I think. Or Bridgeport's about the same. So the challenges on that are, are similar, but they're well pointed out. Because you only have 17 square miles and you look at a lot of the other communities, rural or suburban, they have much bigger geographic footprints. So, and, and their needs are not as, as great. But like you also said before, 40%, roughly 40% of our property in Hartford is tax, tax exempt. exempt. And I think that's Shoot. close to $4 billion in property that's tax exempt. Um, so it's an equation that's terribly uh, terrible and that it works against our cities and forces higher property taxes. So what do we, uh, uh, well, we look to fully fund it under, yeah. under a formula that would help to stabilize or reduce property taxes, especially for the seniors. Um, there's a couple ways to do it which I'd be happy to discuss with you, but the point is it would be a priority of mine because we have to do it. Otherwise, we're going to have this disincentive for businesses and people to live, own, buy property, affect property values in, our, in, in certain communities because of those. And then what happens is a spiral effect. It forces the rest up and, and so on. So it has to be a priority. And there has to be a way to fund it, and there is. Okay, because we have a lot of, as we say, lots of, I, I think any state government should look at all the empty lots that they have in their town and start trying to get buy-in to develop those properties. Right. You know, Hartford has more concrete um, laying around than any other town, I would think, right? How do we get people to come in and say, hey, we can develop this property, make it prime property? I mean, yeah, we're not bridge, we're not um, um, Boston and New York, but we could do something to make the state of Connecticut be a little more attractive mm -hmm. for people wanting to come here. You, Bridgeport, and I'm sure most people know where it is, most people have been there, is right on 95. Huge amounts of traffic travel through your city every day on, on I-95, and a lot of them get off and go into the city. Thoughts on tolls? Yeah, I'd like to have that situation paid for by out-of-state truckers and, and cars, out-of-state plates. Yeah. So so the goal would be that everybody has a plate from New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, or anywhere, they drive through, they, they get pay. a toll. They pay for it, because they're beating up our infrastructure. We have to pay when we go through right. their town. And avoid and minimize it on Connecticut residents, much as the long run allow. Do you think it takes a $10 million study no. to do that? No, or no. I don't think it Just did. a little bit of common sense in the legislature. This is just exactly. not right. Ten million, ten million. A lot of money for a study. Of course it is. I mean, what, what, who are you giving ten million dollar to? I mean, somebody. You could just go to Boston or go to New York and ask them how did they do it. Yeah. You know why are you spending ten million dollar? I think that's really unnecessary and called for. And something you probably wouldn't have much control over. You'll have a bully pulpit as governor, but um, immigration policy. I know you recently went down to the Texas border to see the detention centers or whatever we want to call them. Um, thoughts on that? Yeah, it, it's gotten so far out of control <laughs> God, yes. that you see inhumane actions mm -hmm. led yes. by federal government that is tearing apart families, literally, as we know. Now, some, this is some reunification. You wonder why they even have to do this. Um, thousands. And that's why I went down there. I was joined in, or joined 
uh, the mayor of New York and the mayor of Los Angeles and others. And we stood in solidarity to express our, our outrage, our disapproval. We, we, we said we can't tell the federal government what to do, but we can represent the largest populations and centers in, this, in the country and say we disagree with this. We think it's, in my view, it was unmoral and un-American. Yeah, it's, it's and that we need heartless. to act and raise our voices and even locally to uh, to not never become, as we said locally, um, with local police departments or in my city and others, to be an arm of immigration. It's not a role. And, and what they're doing and how they're doing is not something that we should be a part of. I would like to see them stop. Oh, but the, the big issue, and I don't, a lot of people don't think about this, it's not the president that passes laws. A lot of this immigration problem, and we know our immigration system is broke, it lies in the lap of Congress. Congress changes the laws. If, if you don't agree with it, it's not working, then pass some laws to change it. And I think we've got to not just focus on Trump, 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 right. and start looking at our congressional delegations. What are you doing? They've been very instead quiet. Of run, instead of running for, no, they run for the TV cameras every chance they have, but they don't sit down and build consensus to say, this is wrong, let's fix it. And I think that's what we need to to be focusing on too. Well, hold on though, you're, you, you and hold on to your seat because he's also uh, expecting to shut down the government if we don't come no, up with that's something. No, that's just nonsense. No, everybody, it's, 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 everybody it's, it's a bully that. tactic that, that that's it's been continued done to plenty use. of times before. But okay, um, back to our stuff. I've I've asked on, on a local level in this Democratic primary, which is August fourteenth coming up, for my opponent to fill out a financial disclosure. I've offered to fill one out too. It's what the governor of Cuomo in New York has done. So that all those things talk about transparency. I've tried to be very transparent. I've asked him to do the same thing because with all the businesses involved with entanglements, are there relationships with the state of Connecticut that people should know about? I'm not saying there's anything wrong, but uh, he's denied doing or, or, or refused to answer that. And then he's refused to even um, say we're both Democrats. And, and he's actually hinted that he would support a Republican if I become the nominee and beat him. Mm. Which I don't understand because that would help tear down. That's just that's totally wrong for anybody. To yeah, just to say, say that, something you know. like that. We can't afford to have a Republican yeah. governor. We need to keep her. Sorry about well, that, but we have to do that. Going going back to Bridgeport a little bit. Um, I know growing up and in my early adult years, you always heard about crime in Bridgeport and how dangerous it was. Father Panic Village and everything else. How have you? I think your homicide rate is a lot less than the other cities in the state right now. How have you turned that around, or what have you done with law enforcement to be able to make it a safer city? Yeah, made it a top priority to work towards getting community policing. We added 100 police officers so we can start the real steps of community policing. Have after school programs in most of our schools, mm, which we've In won. the school, he says. Yeah, in the schools. Okay. Some of youth recreation program, um, and trying to create job opportunities. Now, again, we cities are always work in progress, so every time I say something that's good, I always say but every morning we've got to wake up and try and do a better job because somebody's somebody's going to be the victim. You know, you're never, you're never going to have zero crime. Uh, you're never going to have perfect schools. You're never going to have um, the cleanest and, and, and zero unemployment in your city. But um, all those are factors, and um, we've uh, I, I've made it a, a top priority to, um, to have those relationships even under the most difficult of times between the community and our police department, um, hopefully be as best they can be in a community that understands that we need to work together. Um, and youth programs are critically important, so we can't do enough on those. But yes, we've had some success with that. And understand that dynamic, again, different than my opponent, is the type of thing that will make our whole state better, working with municipal leaders. You can't just come out of the business world and say, oh, I'm gonna fix this problem without knowing exactly how all those tender issues work together right. uh, between some of our communities and, our, and should be with state support. I would like to go back to to um, the prison to um, the real world here. And when I, when I say that, I mean, we have a lot of people in jail and who is really providing some form of training? So when these people get out of jail, actually there's a pipeline to a job. 
Is there a disconnect between that and 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 getting that job? I think that's part well, of the should, problem. We don't we don't should, supply that training. Shouldn't the, should if we really want these people back productive citizens of of the country or the world, shouldn't we be saying, um, okay, so you're in here for how long? Okay, we're going to make sure you're trained to do a job. So when you get out, we have already someone inside who's working with someone on the outside to say, hey, Mr. Brown is coming out. Here's where Mr. Brown is going to get a job. Do you do you see something like that could work much yes. better uh, if we really put the effort to it? And we have to do it in a much more comprehensive way. So we're doing. We have an office I created, uh, Mayor's uh, Reentry. It's a reentry opportunity, and we've we've reached out to a number of businesses and asked those businesses would they consider individuals that come through our system to allow them to have a job opportunity. And a number of them have, and it's worked. But it's too small of a number. Right. And our other cities have them too. So we need a much more comprehensive program. Because that individual, you're not either looking in favor or against that one individual. It's that one individual and their family. Maybe he, he or she's a father or mother. Mm -hmm. Certainly a son or a daughter, sister or brother. And that whole family support system, if whatever it is, has, has impact as well. Then the neighborhood. Where does that individual live? If they're not working, what's going on? Have we? So you need opportunities for sometimes job training, but certainly a job opportunity. It's not going to be a door closed in their face because they have a, a, a felony conviction. One, two. Sometimes you need a health uh, support, either physically mm -hmm. or mentally, mm -hmm. um, counseling, especially with parent-child relationships. Um, so that's an element that we should support more. Affordable places to live, good, clean, decent, affordable place to live. Uh, is an element of that as well. And so by not doing that, if you're not putting resources, which the state has done, they've cut back on those resources, those social resources that many times nonprofits are administering, sometimes local governments are administering, sometimes directly from the state. But they cut back on those with this budget. It's looked at, I guess, I gotta assume, and this is not you know, to, to poke at anybody, but oh, well, you know, we gotta cut that. It's not that big of a deal. What well, is a big deal? It is. And if there is a financial cost associated with it, maybe not directly, but certainly indirectly, uh, as well as as well as to uh, to a whole community. Because so that puzzles me for years about the disconnect here. And now you know our form, our now governor talking about second chance, second chance. It's all good to talk about second chance, but what are you giving me a second chance to do? It's just lip service. You know, it's a lip nothing. service. Yeah, because if you're not doing the connection, why are you right. calling it second chance? Well, see, that's yeah, and I don't know how familiar you are with the community court program, but Hyacinth was we instrumental on getting that started in, in Hartford. And we used to have a great program, even for prostitution, drug users. There was mental health, social mm -hmm. workers, counseling, and pretty much all that's gone by the Strip wayside. Away. Yeah. So now, Strip away. and even as far as the Department of Correction, we know the areas in the city where the van comes into South Green Park, and on your release date, the van comes in, drops Drop you off, them and all. you're on your own. Right. And then we wonder why people repeat offend because they go and they, they see that change or that laptop sitting in a car, they break into it because they don't have any, you were a unique inmate, I, I would think, because you had the family and the support structure when you came out. So many of our convicted felons don't have that. And then they wonder why they go back into the cycle and go back to prison. So we need to start breaking that cycle and try to get people on the right path because the support is there. And it can't all be cut because of budgets. Right. You know, penny wise okay. and pound foolish. Yeah, because we're paying all this much money, like what, a, a, a college tuition um, a, a year or whatever, for people to be locked up behind bars. Why aren't we using that same money and say, hey, we're going to do this training for these no. people? Because you know, it comes down to leadership, an issue of leadership. There's been but, poor, frankly, Republican policies that have erred on the side of, of a system that is predominantly punitive as opposed to uh, one that provides rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. When you have that, I understand it makes good politics for them at certain points in time, but you have, you, you've eliminated, you've eliminated the elements that help an individual to get rid of the community oh. and come back. What you said is, to a certain extent, and this is me preaching, uh, it certainly sounds it's self-serving, but put me aside for a second. You, you made the decision then that this punitive, and if it's not rehabilitated, that that person is kind of gone. They're in a different category now. And they're not going to be provided the opportunity to be, forget about their own uh, desire to better the lives of themselves. 
they're not going to be along this phrase, which is important, a contributing member to society to the that. level that they could be. So what, who loses in that equation? We all do. We all do. Well, I don't think you can totally do away with the punitive aspect no, because that, people no, have to that, somehow say, I don't want to go back there. That's a terrible spot. But you also got to come out stronger than you went in and have a leg up on getting your life back in, right, in right. order. And I think that's the part that we really don't do enough. You know, there, years ago, we used to have the wood shops and furniture making and everything. So if you went into prison, you could potentially come out with a career as a cabinet maker or whatever. I don't know if we still do that. I don't think we do. But, okay, another big issue, the opioid crisis. Oh, huge. Mm -hmm. Is that, I would imagine it's a big problem in Bridgeport. It's a huge problem in Hartford. We have people dying almost every day. Um, how would you combat that or what? We have to continue to do everything we can. I've not been passive or sitting on the sidelines. Again, something distinguishes me from my opponent in this August 14th Democratic primary. I've been doing things with this. I've, in my community, has followed the lead of uh, the Waterbury Mayor, Mayor O'Leary. We joined a lawsuit suing the collusion, on, based on the collusion between the pharmaceutical companies and the doctors. And the criminal conduct that's caused them to make hundreds, thousands, who knows how many, individuals who normally just maybe in for a medical procedure, uh, end up being addicted to uh, a substance that's mm -hmm. heroin based. Mm -hmm. And then break out of the normal comfort of their law abiding lifestyle, end up being elements become that an individuals that become an addict and usually become, have some type of, if not a health problem, it could be overdose, but health problem, they have a legal problem on top of it. And all the, 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 the heartache and, and pain that goes along with that. So we, we've done that. We've also done an awareness program. Uh, both as a city through our health director and as a, as a region with other mayors and, and their health directors. To get an awareness out from individuals, um, from, from public officials, especially health directors, experts in the field, to say, be aware of this. We need to, we need to be careful with this. We need to have a, have a, a public awareness health um, um, system for communications and information. Because otherwise, any of us could do this. I've had my arm, I have my, my, my arm, fixed after an operation. They give you prescriptions. We should be able to, who knows how many's right and how many's not. Right. And certainly, and I can't tell you about my instance, but certainly there's instances I'm sure where they just over, over prescribe the doctor, presumably right. Lord of these, these Because lessons, that's how they make their big money. They make their money. Yeah. And then the victim is that mm -hmm. person, that individual who went in for just a medical treatment. So and there's very little oversight also of the warning signs of somebody that is becoming addicted and is just craving the, the opioids. Um, and that's, you know, it, it's a huge issue. And the more I talk to people, the more you see, and I hate to use the word junkie, but it's not just the junkie we think on the street corner shooting up with a needle in his arm. It's the kid that hurt himself playing baseball or whatever, or a sports injury, and got hooked on Oxycontin. It's just, it's across the board. I read yeah. an article over the weekend about a Navy admiral whose son became addicted, um, I think it was after a car accident, and he ended up dying over a fentanyl overdose. But it's just, a, it's a huge problem out there now. Um, and you know, I don't know how you address it, but I think it's also important you as a mayor see these things and see the damage that's sure. done day in and day out. In every community across every age group, <clears throat> across every ethnic group, across every de uh, economic uh, bracket, it has become an epidemic in our state. And <clears throat> something that we can't do uh, nationally. So, we can't so, do it so shouldn't be this this be something that we are, you know, knowing what kind of federal government we have, we should be pushing more in Washington and say, hey guys, we have epidemic here. We need it's just like any you know disease that we have outbreak on. We look for the federal government to help us to address some of these issues. Sure. Um, you know, and I know Trump wasn't big on the fact that we need to fix this opioid, opioid, opioid. We need to fix it. But as a state, what has he done? Does anybody from the state actually gone to sit down with their health department person, even though their health department person is not really a doctor? So I'm not sure how he knows what to do. You know, so again, the government of each town or state need to be working with the federal government to say, hey, this is what we're going to need some help with. Because, you know, I know it works in England. We went to England. They had this big thing like the community court where they had all the services under that one umbrella. Mm -hmm. So you could go from one place to the next place and you get the services that you need. So See, I think, it, it, and this is probably going to be popular to say this, especially with a couple of Democrats sitting here with me, but mm -hmm. we need to get to the point where we start thinking 
about our citizens first and start making sure programs and money are put into things that are killing people here, whether it's crime, drugs, whatever. Um, we give so much money to countries that are our enemies. And, but we don't worry about that veteran that's coming home hooked on drugs or you know that kid that's going through college hooked on. We need to start focusing on our own neighbors and friends and family members here first. And that's true. We need to we need to look at the wider world too. Um, another, and this is again, this is your experience as a mayor that you've had to deal with this. Something came up in a forum last week, which I think was fairly uncomfortable for you. Um, it was regarding a police-involved shooting. And I think any politician or any mayor say, but for the grace of God, there go I. Because that could happen, you know, anywhere. Maybe you want to say a little bit about that and why you... Well, sure. I think you were kind of offended think, by it. But. Uh, well, I was offended by, my, by, uh, by Lamont's comments. I thought he politicized a very sensitive issue that a tragedy for a family, a tragedy for a police department in a community, in a city, a tragedy for our state and to politicize it and not understand the sensitivities of it regardless of the like, what i've tried to do and right or wrongly on it is make the right decisions where i was in a position to make them uh, this really was handled on a legal end by the chief state's attorney's office as it is by law yeah. what i said was sometimes your authority can't go where your heart your authority doesn't take you where your heart may want to go. It's a tragedy it's no a matter tragedy how you look at no it. tragedy no matter what. And um, to politicize it in the sense because, oh, geez, this is a great way to, to take a shot at Joe in the middle of a, of a situation where you have people that are very, very emotional, family members included, I just thought it was inappropriate and um, not the way to handle it. So, look, when you're a mayor, when you're a governor um, in these type of positions, if you're head of an organization, you've got to, you know, these are there's difficult things that you have to kind of bear and um and i don't mean that you know but we all suffer from it but certainly not to the level of the family or friends and my heart goes out to them and um and to what happened in that terrible tragedy i want to ask you about the economic do you have an economic plan for the state sure you should become governor we need another hour <laughs> it's okay i just need to hear what he got well look at if we're, what we're doing is just not working the the major decisions that impact businesses that impact jobs um, are, in my view, just not being, from a government perspective, being handled the way that I would handle them. And I'll tell you how I would change them. Um, you see a GE leaving, going from an urban, a suburban center in Fairfield, close to me, to uh, an urban center, a city in Massachusetts to Boston. Had was talking about leaving. You had um, Alexion after getting state money. Obviously, we have policies when you see major employers uh, fail policies because major employers are leaving. I can contrast that with the bringing in of over a billion dollars of groundless growth with major investment in one city, in my city, from companies that are out of state, New York and New Jersey. One's $550 million, um, another one's $400 million, which will build the new tallest buildings along I-95, a new skyline um, for Bridgeport. A third, spending almost $250 million in recapturing a lot of the old factories and making cool warehouse uh, housing uh, with, uh, you know, for artists or young people, hopefully even anyone who wants to live there. Affordable, at the same time though, as part of a new uh, five, but again, outside New York investor coming in spending some $250 million. So, so there's examples of, of successes in, in where companies are leaving now around the state, and I will tell you where I've been for the last two and a half years, where we're bringing them in. So you can put two and two together and maybe give me credit for some of them, but it is what it is. At least I understand how it can be done, I've played some role in it. But on a bigger picture, the big pieces that are not being utilized the way they should be, in my view, are our two major sources of expenditures for development, economic development, infrastructure, and transportation. One is the Department of Economic Development and the Housing Department, they're really separate departments, but those two, for instance. How do you coordinate your development arm, focused on generally on business retention and growth, with your housing, obviously there's some elements there that need to be coordinated, and for another department, the only, probably spends the most money, even out of all three and largest, is Department of Transportation. Hundreds of millions, maybe billions of dollars a year if you do it right. And how are those transportation decisions 
being made over here? Why are they? And why are economic development decisions being made over here? And then housing maybe, maybe a little closer over here, but still not being coordinated. So I would coordinate them under, I don't like the term, but a type of czar, a super agency, not creating a bureaucracy or more, or more positions, but probably consolidating, or at least having them work around the table so that when you're putting, when you're making transportation decisions on where a train station is going to be, or where a highway ramp is going to be, you also have the coordination with the other two major elements of well, we're housing this, or where you're trying to uh, create job growth, not just in our cities, but certainly with an emphasis on cities because they're critical elements of it. So that would be some of the overlay. And then I would use enterprise zones or incentive-based, geographically incentive-based opportunities like have been utilized in the past to encourage targeted industries, the type that we want, if we can get them, that we know produce the type of jobs we want, that are growth industries, that are, that are gonna, if we can and, and put the educational elements in place in some of our centers for higher learning, some of them are state, um, some of our community colleges, predominantly, by the way, community colleges. Not, not to cut you off, but we're almost out of time. And support and that, so the jobs, 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 jobs. <laughs> so I come with, okay. as you can see, I come I passionate, jobs. I come with the experience. Hopefully I come with a level of humility over my over my failures in the past, but also I think with the opportunity to get Connecticut well, inspired again. I think it was question. important we got a lot of that out there for the people of Hartford to hear. Um, hopefully if the voters see fit after the 14th, we can get you back as a Absolutely. nominee for governor and go more in depth into your economic development plans and how you're gonna fix the state of Connecticut. Um, I wanna thank you for thank making you. the trip up today. My pleasure, thanks for having me. Thank you for your questions and for listening. <laughs> Okay, so on the 14th, make sure if you're a registered Democrat, or even if you're a registered Republican, there's a Republican primary, I think. Too, right, right, but I'm on the second so, line. Row B is Gannon for governor. Okay, well, row B team. And it's kind of Good funny luck. because there's a young lady named Gannon running, too. The Gannon. State, Gannon. First name is Gannon. Gannon, Gannon. Long. Oh, for what? Yeah, uh, running for state rep. State rep in the oh. third district. Okay, <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay, Trish, I think we're about out of time, right? Okay. okay. All okay. right, everyone, take care. Make sure you remember to go out and vote on the 14th. 14th. And I don't think we'll be here next month unless you want to come on the wall. I've got an ophthalmologist to find. Okay. So I'll be blinded with the.